we are going giant today because we're going to talk about the universe itself and okay. its origins, okay? So many people have said that the universe may have come about naturalistically, but yet the mechanisms for this natural origin of the universe are very vague, aren't they? Yep. Yeah, the, um, and so one important point to make early on is the, yeah, the theory is popularly known as the Big Bang, mm -hmm. or one of the more popular ones now, mm -hmm. and it in itself requires a supernatural origin. And so even though uh -huh. it might be, you know, cloaked in, you know, fancy sounding terminology, mm -hmm. it's always an appeal to a false god, be it uh, it started a singularity or somewhere outside the universe, there's this multiverse generator, or, or depending on which part of, or, or which version of the theory people want to go with, they always appeal to the supernatural. So I want to right up front state that the there is no naturalistic theory for the origin of the universe uh, because it requires a supernatural origin. And well, of course, so we're not going with our <clears throat> laws, known laws in physics. We're having to appeal to a supernatural power. Right, right, because the, uh, they'll say, well, the laws of physics didn't you know, exist before the universe existed. <laughs> Time didn't exist. For, well, but that's an appeal to the supernatural. Yeah. You know, uh, it kind of kind of reminds me of you know, the question when you know, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, okay, then who created God? If, if God created the heavens and the earth, who created God? But that's the whole point. When it says in the beginning, that means God created, created time, time also. Uh, because God created time, he has to be outside of time. And anything outside of time, by definition, can't be created. It can't have a beginning uh, because it's outside the dimension of time. And so first verse of the Bible addresses that problem. And, you know, again, people that don't want to put their faith in the Bible, they try to tap dance around the issue <laughs> or they, you know, they just... Um, make things up or try to sound technical, but it always appeals to a supernatural origin. But, and yet they call it science, and they say yeah. that there's this abundance of evidence for <clears throat> yeah. the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, at best it's religion, okay. and it's really, it's almost to the point now I would almost call it also fake science. Uh, wow. Some of the uh, reasoning behind that, you know, right now we have to make up about 96% of the universe for okay. the Big Bang, basically for what the theory would predict to match our observations. Uh, we need roughly 23% uh, of the universe to be what they call dark matter. Okay. We need about 73% of the universe to be what they call dark energy. And so we're making up 96% of the universe. Hmm. And so that's starting to not be too scientific. And yeah. when you really think about that, if I'm allowed to um, uh, make up that much of the universe, well, is there any theory that someone could postulate that I couldn't force to match any observations I wanted to? In other words, I have my observations, yeah. then I can make up 96% of the universe, and then I have this theory. Well, if I do that, I mean, there is literally no... You can fudge the theory yeah, there however is, you want. There's absolutely no theory that I couldn't pretend is supported by my observations. It's like, uh, without getting too fancy, you know, don't, no algebra allowed, but if I yeah. say, uh, if X plus Y is 100, uh -huh. what does X equal? Well, just, just give me a number. Five. Five, you're absolutely right. Because <laughs> Y is 95, uh, you know, X is, X is five, oh. Y is 95, you're right, the answer is 100. You can uh, solve it no matter and, uh, what I say. Yeah, but yeah, yeah no, say you said it's 20, I say you're absolutely right. X is 20, Y is 80, the answer is 100. Now say I get down the road, I get a little smarter, I say uh -huh. I really wish the answer was 200 instead of 100. Uh -huh. Okay, well, guess what, your, your two answers were fine. Because now if X is five, I just make Y 195. If X was 20, I just make Y 180. So. <clears throat> Once I'm allowed to put that much fudge factor in, um, it, it ceases to be science. I mean, even though it's presented as being scientific, uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. You also have things like inflation. You have, you have all of this, basically, fudge factors is the best way to describe it, that have had to be added to try to pretend that the Big Bang is a scientific theory or a real theory. Isn't that fascinating? Now, you mentioned <clears throat> inflation. Break that down for Okay, so let's, let's start with the very yep. beginning, many people would say that space and time began to expand, right. that the universe was created as it went 14 billion years So then space years had ago. to expand extremely rapidly, okay. and then that expansion had to stop. We have no idea why it would have done that. Yeah, we can just, but to make the theory work, that's uh -huh. what has to happen to try to match some of the other data that we see today. And so, so the, the theory is kind of, I guess you'd say, just rife with those kinds of, of, of assumptions. You know, it's, um, a lot, a lot of people have noticed this. I want to make it clear also, there's, it's not that Christians are alone in noticing these facts. Uh, I'll read a, a quote, uh, his former NASA administrator, Mike Griffin, really smart guy, great guy. Yeah. Um, but he, um, 
he, he's justifying, you know, why do we explore space? Mm -hmm. And he says, what is the value of discovering that literally 95% of the universe consists of dark energy or dark matter, terms for things that we as yet know nothing about, but they make up 95% of our universe. And See, what, what he's saying is that dark energy and dark <laughs> matter are just terms for saying we don't know? Yeah, or they have to have specific properties. Okay. But again, those properties and the percentages are defined to try to make the observations match what the theory would predict. Fascinating. Okay, so we <laughs> ask people on the street, when they think of an explosion, do explosions generally bring matter together or apart? And here's what we got. Great. Apart, I would think, yes. Tears it apart. So um, the first thing you think of in an explosion is just kind of a violent separation of the, the contents of the item that actually exploded. Um, but it's actually sending all kinds of matter um, into the air, into the soil. So I, I would contend that it's both. An explosion tears it apart. They, they separate. Matter is just matter. I don't, I mean, it's just more just like a displacement of matter. Oh, because of gravity. So I guess it tears it apart, but then it brings it back together slowly, but surely. I think both because um, explosions, you tear stuff apart, and but the particles can still be attached. Tear particles apart. I think it physically tears things apart because obviously there is an explosion. Um, I think it tears it apart, maybe, um, because it's a, why can't it do both? Maybe it does both? Tear them apart. I think it, it tears it apart. You think of it exploding. An implosion would come in. So I think the obvious answer is tear apart, but I don't know. There's probably a better answer. But that's what X I would think. Instead of Im implode versus explode, okay. I think. I think. Now, those are good observations. The Big Bang, many scientists would contend, was not an explosion within space, but actually a rapid expansion of space-time itself. The problem still applies, doesn't it, that the farther each particle of matter gets from each other, the less likely it is to ever be pulled in by mutual gravity and create the first star, the first planet, the first galaxy, or anything, right? Right.